for me, this is a matter of principle. This is about doing the right thing for veganism and for the future of animal rights and ecology. All right, how's it going, guys? I can't believe it. We have Eisel here on the line, and we are super excited for this interview today. And we just want to start off by saying, Eisel, thank you so much for taking your time out of your precious day to spend it here with us. Thanks very much, guys. I apologize for my voice, and if I cough a bit, I have been a bit sick here. I am currently in Kunming, China, not in Chiang Mai. I just left Chiang Mai a few days ago, uh, but yeah, I'm straight north from there in China now. Great to see you guys. We've just been having a great informal conversation before we hit the record button, uh, but hey, I mean, if you guys, we can be as formal as informal as you want. I'm really happy to meet you guys. I was just giving them a lot of credit. I feel like that they're guys who've uh, demonstrated tremendous personal integrity, and I think probably their their recent moves on YouTube are going to bring them a lot of positive attention, of people taking them a lot more seriously, as not just a couple of guys who take their shirts off, but as guys who really have something positive to contribute to this project we have that ultimately is about saving the world. Yeah, absolutely. Just thank you so much. And obviously, we didn't do this for the attention. Obviously, we didn't go. You don't go vegan for the attention. Yeah. You go vegan and you do this stuff because you support the truth. And you do it no matter what happens. And it turns out the world is waking up. The world is getting smarter. And to everyone watching this, I just want to say thank you so much for all the support that we have been receiving because we were ready to lose a couple thousand yeah, yeah, yeah. subscribers. And I have never been more nervous pressing the upload button in my life, guys. And, and, and it has gone over so well. All the thumbs up and, show, and showing Eisel and us. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Well, I yeah, and I you guys will see a difference in the quality of subscribers you have because you're going to get people following you who are smart enough to know what's going on and who care about the principle of the thing. As you were just saying, you know, this is a matter of principle. This is ultimately a matter of right and wrong. And those will be the people who now are following you and respecting you increasingly. So, yeah. Absolutely. And I just want to uh, also say that uh, this interview is not about a Duran Ryder hate campaign or a slander video. This is just about talking i feel like there's been a lot of mystery and a lot of fogginess and this is just all about clearing the air and getting the truth out there because this really is an issue that needs to have the answer out there and then when you can all just move on so i absolutely love it by the way that people are creating an air of mystery around me because there's <laughs> nothing mysterious about my life and like what they did with my life at every stage i was pretty much whining about it on the internet so, like, there's evidence from every period of my life of what I was doing. Like, back, so we mentioned I used to be a scholar of Buddhism. During those years, there were, like, uploads that show you where I was and who I was studying with and what I was doing. Because I was going to Buddhist monasteries and spending time with Buddhist monks and writing articles about it. So, I mean, I wish, I wish I lived this mysterious life. But, hey, if the people who hate me are now creating a kind of mystique, a kind of legend around me, that's great. <laughs> well, you, honestly, you kind of have like a James Bond thing going on here. I mean, this is really like, this is really covert ops. I mean, well, look, we, 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 yeah. yeah, sorry. Well, think so. No, I mean, it's funny because people have, have accused me of working for the CIA in the past. Like when I was living in Laos, when I was living, because I was, oh, wow. yeah, yeah, I was living out in the, the Golden Triangle for a while. So the border between Laos and Myanmar where there was still civil war going on. And then after that, I was writing about and involved with a border war between um, Cambodia and Thailand. So there were people who looked at that and said, oh, gee, this guy is always where the action is. He's always doing scholarship, you know, the sort of things the CIA would be interested in and thought, thought I was the kind of highly competent person the CIA might employ. <laughs> but uh, um, so I, I know why people have said that about me in the past. And I, I, in the past, I've also found it hilarious. But the reality of the type of scholarship and research I do, on the one hand, there's the purely textual side. So, like, when I was out in small villages where, you know, you're sleeping in a bamboo hut, you know, in a town that has no running water, no electricity, people are not wearing shoes, people are barefoot in the dirt, people are close to starving, where they suffer from seasonal starvation, malnutrition problems, et cetera, extreme poverty. Um, when I was out there, on the one hand, there was the humanitarian work. On the other hand, there was just literally sitting under a mosquito net with a flashlight. Because when there's no lights, you know, you're, you're, you're reading the book with a flashlight, studying languages, both ancient and modern, just spending hours and hours doing that kind of work. And then beyond that, there's the sort of, there's the combination of two. There's the humanitarian research. And that can be looking into problems like HIV AIDS. It actually included looking into problems like sex trafficking, like sexual exploitation of, of teenagers and minors. More than 10 years ago, I've got some really interesting articles on exactly that. So it's a bit hilarious to me when people are saying that I came to Thailand to, to, to sleep with young women. I've actually written about, I've done research on that phenomenon, including the problem of that within humanitarian work, when humanitarian agencies get into sexually exploiting people. Uh, you know, a whole diversity of issues having to do basically with uh, poverty, development, um, hope for a better future. So, you know, the, the reality of the work I was doing is not mysterious, it's not glamorous, 
and it's not something the CIA would ever pay me for. <laughs> so no, I've, I've, uh, I haven't been with, with the CIA, but I, I do know. I mean, those rumors are always going to be there that I'm that I'm working for something with the CIA, especially because, as you guys may not know, um, I, I signed up to join the Canadian military only a few months ago. So I'm on the record about that too. So you know, it's natural. Yeah, that, and, yeah. and they, um, yeah, I just want to say that there's, there is a lot of like. Um, of mystery going on in a, and more importantly like we do have to talk about all the controversy that is going on but more importantly i do want to talk about the political activism part and this is what i feel a lot of the people that ha do realize what's going on are interested in talking about sure look i mean i just say the i think one of the saddest misconceptions about my channel is when people say it is negative talking about political reality is not negative Admitting there's a problem and saying, look, guys, we got to get organized. we got to solve this problem. That's not negative. That's constructive. That's the most positive thing we can do. And on the contrary, from my perspective, saying, hey, let's just all go on vacation. Let's have a party. Let's wear a bikini. Let's pretend these problems don't exist. To me, that is deeply negative. So on this question of just the general significance of politics and, and being concerned – you know, being concerned about what's going on in the world. I see that as a tremendously positive thing, whether it's from a humanitarian angle or from an openly political angle. And uh, it's always been sad to me to see people respond to the material on my channel as negative for that reason. Yeah, yeah that's the thing, too. I want to just talk about everyone that is watching this right now that uh, I've been through your channel probably a lot more than a lot of people, like hours and hours, enough to be comfortable to upload what I did. Right. And it's, I mean... Honestly, it's not the most interesting stuff. You can sit there and, I mean, like have some free time, but it's all there. It's you, you have been quite clear about everything, and you've been quite honest this entire time through the hours and hours and hours and hours of uploads. Right. Well, thanks. And that's the other thing is I've never been trying to be entertaining. Fans of my channel do say there is a lot of comedy in it because I do laugh. You know, I do kind of make sarcastic remarks in the middle of things. But fundamentally, I mean, it's amazing. If, I've always said, if just 2,000 people want to watch my videos, that's great. I'm totally happy with that because what I'm doing is not appealing to a mass market. And, you know, meanwhile, I mean, there are guys like you and Vegan Cheetah who, you know, work out a lot more at the gym and take off your shirts. Great. You know, that's wonderful for you guys, too. There are people who sing and dance. I said that ages ago about Henya. You know, Henya, part of a reason she got famous, she did some music videos. That's great, too. Different people can contribute in different ways. And obviously, some people are going to be like chefs. If you actually work in a kitchen, if your job is being a chef, is cooking food, and you want to do a food channel, vegan, that's great, too. But that's not the contribution I have to make. I'm not saying I'm a terrible cook. I'm just saying there would be no reason for me to come on YouTube and make cooking videos. You know, the kind of cooking I'm about is, you know... Uh, worried about global warming cooking this whole fucking planet you know Absolutely. what i'm worried about is getting at the deep underlying issues and getting vegans to wake up get organized and make something really positive happen within my lifetime next 10 years and yeah and that's a point i really want to make is that because i've seen durant and the points that we made in our video they have they are events that have happening over time and for me just seeing how like you obviously it's not the most interesting although yes it is funny at times but uh there's so much unique value that is missing from the community and they're like the way you talk about it, i haven't heard any vegan or anything or anyone talk like that and and for 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 duran to do what he did i, I just that I, I i we had to do something i was gonna say just um you same for sure i don't know which one you are i can see the other one wants to talk there's i just heard you guys as the light twins the two of you are there wearing the same shirt i can't say oh jack wants to talk i don't know <laughs> Yo, dog, i'm just... henry this is Jason. Yeah, I, I, I'm Jason. So, um, so, uh, so, yeah. So, when we, when we went to your channel, it's the first time we've ever heard about actually getting politically involved and getting organized. And we and and, and we were doing some small a small amount of research, and we we're looking at PETA, and they were started a, with a group of people around a table saying we have a lot of talent here. Let's do something with it. And we feel that the vegan community of YouTube is just you know we have a there's a deep rich talent pool of people here. That are obviously passionate about what they do and, and we want to get involved, but we don't know how. If we had the right kind of petition, we could get a million s s s signatures on that right now. Like if we just passed it around the community, and like what could that do? So, so, uh, so we hear you talk about this, and it just sounds like a great direction, and we just want to know how to get more involved and how to go about this in a political standpoint. Well, look, I, I mean, one of my one of my uh, fans, uh, her name is Amy, and she's in Halifax. So you guys are Canadian, you'll know. Halifax is a small city. It's a city, but it's a small city, and she had only been vegan for seven weeks 
when she started seriously organizing, you know, community activism, real political activism. And she's a fan of my channel. She kind of watched the videos on my channel and then put these ideas into practice. Now, the other thing is she actually did have a background in community organization unrelated to veganism. But to me, that's one of the most stunning examples. This person was only vegan for about a month when she started watching my videos, thinking about it, and then actually organizing events and organizing people. Now, my impression is I've, I've, talked to, I've tried to stay in touch with her, but you know, I've been traveling. Um, she's had really tremendously positive outcomes so far. And this is Halifax. I mean, Hall you guys know it's just, it's just there's, not, there's not that much um, – Potent I mean, it's a small city. I just say, sorry, I don't want to, I'm not here to insult Halifax, but I mean, in some ways, I would, I would find that daunting. You'd say, how many vegans can we organize in Halifax? How many people are interested in vegans? But there are people who have taken inspiration from my channel directly into action, where they're doing real political organization and they're taking these ideas forward. And ironically, I, I by the way, I also upload podcasts to Patreon. There's the, my YouTube channel, but I also have exclusive content on Patreon, quite a lot of it. That's also hours and hours of, of hearing me talk, sometimes hearing me interview people and so on. But on Patreon, one of my podcasts, the title is Why I Am Not an Activist. So the other reality in my life right now, right now I'm in China, but because I'm a university student, because I'm doing other things, that kind of direct activism uh, actually is not part of my life right now, even though it is, it is something I'm, I'm promoting and discussing and where I'm inspiring others. And uh, long term, I do want to be engaged with yeah. It sounds like we all need to get organized together. Yeah, I, look, I mean, I don't know how much you guys want to talk about it, but I mean, one of the things. Well, so, let's say I gotta pull, I gotta pull the reins back a little bit because everyone's it. here to talk about the controversy. That's what we need to. Yeah. Like, let's get through that. So the first one I gotta come out with is: Is there any recent updates or any kind of? Um, Thing going on with the courts or anything from Duran yeah, Ryder himself? The, the last thing we heard, yeah, you were asking anyone, anyone in Australia, if if they knew the court system or they could get in contact with you. Uh, what's happening with all that? So the the short answer is yes, I am talking to lawyers. I mean, some of my fans have have said about this controversy. Oh, it's been going on for such a long time already. It feels like a long time, but right now I think it's about one week. You know, it's not yet two weeks. <laughs> So the lawyers, they get back to me, but it's slow. I mean, it's not, a, it's not that fast the process. So, yeah, I am talking to lawyers about, about you know, formal legal action in Australia, and uh, we'll, we'll see what is possible and what the options are. In this case, as you guys know, there's basically there's defamation, but there's also harassment, threats of violence, inciting violence. There's several different routes you could take, several different avenues to dealing with it. And I think this is just my interpretation, but I think the lawyers, they look at this and they know – if they take this case forward, it will get into the newspapers. So for some lawyers, that's a good thing. Some lawyers want to be in the newspaper, but some don't. So we'll see We'll see what happens. But yeah, and then at that point, um, I'm probably going to have to do a fundraiser. I'm probably going to have to ask, well, who wants to, to donate to um, support this legal fund? So there's there are, one of the reasons I haven't done that already, it's quite possible that the legal case will fail, that it will not go forward for technical reasons or financial reasons or what have you. But again, for me, this is a matter of principle. This is about doing the right thing for veganism and for the future of animal rights and ecology. Uh, it's not about my ego. It's not about trying to win. And I think you guys, we all know all of us in this room, I already won. I said a long time ago in this controversy, if they beat me up, I still win. If they kill me, I still win. You can kill me, but you can't take my dignity. And think about what a black mark it would have been on the history of veganism if they had killed me. Think about how everyone now would be saying 2016 was the year when the author of a fad diet book and a how to fix your bicycle book murdered someone because he was really talking about how to get organized, how to make a, a difference through veganism. That would be a low point in the history of veganism. And, you know, obviously, you know I'm, <laughs> I'm not eager uh, for that outcome. But, I mean, th th these are the stakes we're playing with. And on the other hand, I mean, you know, again, I don't consider my own channel negative. I think there's a real message of hope and optimism. When I use examples like cigarette smoking, campaigns to reduce cigarette smoking, my point is these are attainable goals. We have changed the world I mean, within our lifetimes or within the last 50 years. Some things have changed. At the end of World War II, the government was giving people cigarettes for free to encourage them to smoke more. You know, it's, it sounds crazy, but that was definitely <laughs> the end of World War II. You know, we went from that to a whole attitude in government of society of, look, in the long-term future, cigarette smoking has to be eliminated. And we're, not, we're not beating people up and putting them in jail. We're not, you know what I mean? Like, it's not through violent methods, but through public education, through a whole variety of methods. We are trying to squeeze that out. We're trying to trans transform our culture. Mm -hmm.